And now, may we hear the word of God as it's found in the 14th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. One of the most spectacular of the miracles of Christ. May we hear God's inspired word. Matthew 14, verse 22. This was immediately after Christ had fed the 5,000. And straightway, Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit! And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were come into the ship, the wind ceased. Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth thou art the Son of God. And may God speak to us this day through his holy word. May his name ever be praised. Amen. I don't know whether you knew or not that every single last thing in this physical material world and every incident that takes place within it is an illustration of some spiritual and eternal truth. Most people don't know that. And therefore they walk blindly through the world, blind to thousands of great spiritual truths that they pass every day. May God open our eyes that we may see some some that we haven't seen before. About roughly five or six hundred sermons ago, I preached a message which I'm sure you all remember very well. And in it, I described a rather seemingly innocent and insignificant event that took place right back here in the hallway of the church. I was walking through the hall with one of our staff when he saw something on the carpet uh, that didn't seem to belong there and he picked it up and it, it was some kind of human artifact, if you will, made by human hands. It was either a contraption or a part of a larger contraption. I'd never seen anything like it myself when I glanced at it. And he turned it around and around in his hands and he said this, what in the world is this? I didn't know and he didn't know. But then suddenly there came a flash of illumination across his face and he realized what it was. And then he knew what it was for and what he should do with it. Apparently an insignificant event, but it started 
my juices flowing. And since everything and every event in this world is a material illustration of immaterial and eternal things, I began to think. And it occurred to me that that is an illustration of of what? Of life itself. If we don't know what it is, we won't know what it's for. And if we don't know what it's for, we won't know what to do with it. May I say to you, that's where the vast majority of people in America are. And if you doubt that, let me say that I made a a little study, didn't take an hour to do it, and I discovered almost a hundred different definitions of life. Totally disparate definitions. For example, life is a bowl of cherries. Life is a veil of tears. Life is a stage, and all the men and women merely players who strut their parts. And bottom line, it's full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. Life is a a merry-go-round, a carousel. You've got to grab all the gusto you can, because you only go around once. I think... Those four ought to be at least indicative of the fact that people have a widely different understanding of what life is. I would love to have all of you take a card and a pencil. Don't do it. I'd love it, but I'm not asking you to do it. We haven't got time. And complete this sentence. Life is. What would you say? Life is, <laughs> if you don't know what it is, and you don't know what it's for, and you don't know what to do with it. So what is it? Well, let me say that I believe the Bible teaches us that life is a school. Now, some of you are not going to like that because you didn't like school when you were in it. You thought you'd got out of it. You'd always felt if life were a school, you'd really wish for a 70-year recess. But may I point out to you that Jesus Christ is the great teacher, the greatest teacher that ever lived, the teacher non paril. He has no parallel. And we are called to be his disciples. And what is a disciple? From the Greek word mathetes, it is a learner. It is a student, a scholar. We sit in the school of Christ. That's what this life is. And this is a an astonishing school. It is utterly unique. We not only have but one teacher, the greatest teacher that ever lived, but we have but one lesson to be learned. And that is truly the most amazing thing about it of all. It doesn't matter what level you're in, whether it's grade school, high school, college, or graduate school. It doesn't matter what kind of major you have what particular discipline you're in, what course in that discipline you're taking, what subject you happen to be studying, and what test you're undergoing. The phenomenal thing is, in every test, in every subject, in every course, in every discipline, there's one answer. That ought to help you get through school. And that is, that is what? If we don't know what it is, we don't know what it's for, and we don't know what to do with it. Well, let me put the answer in the words of a man who had come to an utter crisis in his life where the ceiling was falling on his head 
his marriage was coming apart, his business had gone bankrupt, he didn't know which way to turn or what to do, and finally, in utter desperation, he turned to God. And he said he seemed that, it seemed that God was far away and he was climbing this huge marble staircase that went up into the air and through the crowd, clouds and on up into the sky higher and higher till at long length he reached the very door to the throne room of God, which he said seemed to him to be 50 feet or more high and at least two or three feet thick solid brass and the door. The doors were closed and locked. And though he beat against those doors with his knuckles until they were bloody and shouted till he was hoarse, finally in utter weariness he slumped to his knees in front of that door. And then he said, after a while, he heard a voice. It was only a whisper. And it came from inside the throne room of God and it seemed to seep under those great brass doors. And the words that he heard were these, trust me. Trust. There it is, my friend, the answer to every question on every test, in every subject, in every course, in every discipline, in every level of the school of life. Boy, that ought to help you get through. Wouldn't you have loved to have the answers to all the tests that you had in school? I just gave them to you. Trust Christ. That's what it is, a school. And that's the curriculum. And that's the answer. And that's the secret, not only of life, but how to get through it serenely and peacefully and joyfully. That's the cure of life. Are you a disciple of Christ's? Are you a learner? Are you a student in his school? Well, today <clears throat> I want to look with you at one of the final exams and one of the courses that the original disciples or students in the School of Christ were taking. The course was called Storms 201. By the way, I should remind you that that is a required course all of you either have or will go through it. Some of you already have Storms 201. Now the disciples had already been through Storms 101. You remember that? Jesus had been teaching and healing and was weary as they crossed the same Sea of Galilee and he was in the back of the boat sound asleep even though the winds came howling down and churned the sea into a boiling cauldron. And terrified as the waves were breaking over the sides of the ship, they went back and shook him and said, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And Jesus calmly stood to his feet in the middle of the boat and calmly lifted his hands and calmly said, Peace, be still. And the waves crouched at his feet. Storm 101 was in the daytime. The sun was shining. Jesus was in the boat. Ah, but in storms 201, it took place at night, in the deepest, darkest night. And Jesus was nowhere to be seen. He was far away and they were all alone in the midst of that sea as the winds came howling down through the various wadis that cut through the mountains that surround the Sea of Galilee. And they can stir that lake up into a fury in no time at all. And uh, William Thompson wrote in The Land and the Book that he had a similar experience when he was there 
when they set out to cross the Sea of Galilee, he said the sun had scarcely set when the wind began to rush down toward the lake and it continued all night long with constantly increasing violence so that when we reached finally the other shore in the morning, the face of the lake was still a huge boiling cauldron. The wind howled down every wadi from the northeast with such fury that no effort of rowers could have brought the boat to shore at any point along that coast. That was a frightening experience to be in. Now Jesus had sent them after feeding the 5,000 and it was not yet evening. And we read that he came unto them in the fourth watch of the night. Now the first watch was six to nine and nine to 12, 12 to three. That meant from three to six. It was almost dawn, still dark, but in the fourth watch that Jesus came, they had been rowing against that hurricane for almost 12 hours. God often allows us, it seems, to get to the end of our own strength before he acts. Truly, man's extremity is God's opportunity. That holds true even unto this day. And I'm sure also that during that night, probably every one of them was saying, at least to himself, why did the Lord let this happen? Didn't Christ know? Why, why did he allow us to get out here in the middle of this terrible storm when he was going away somewhere else? Why? Why did God let this happen to me? Shall I ask how many of you have said that at one time or another? If so, I would point out to you something about this passage. It says, Jesus constrained them to get into the boat and to go to the other side. He didn't merely allow it. He caused it. The storm? Did he know about the storm? He's not the weatherman. He's the weather producer. We read over and over, God sent forth a great storm. God sent a great wind. Why? This was final exams for Storms 201. Trust me. They were having a little problem with that. And so Jesus came. When they saw him, they thought that it was a spirit, and they were affrighted, they were terrified. They said, it is a spirit, and they cried out aloud. And then Jesus said, be not afraid, it is I, be of good cheer. And they heard that musical voice that they'd heard so many times, and their burden was lifted, and their hearts rejoiced. And then Peter said, how many times we read that in the Bible? He said, Lord, if it be thou, Command me to come unto thee upon the water. And Jesus said, come. He didn't say, Peter, come. When he called Lazarus out of the grave, what did he say? Lazarus, come forth. Why? Suppose he just said, come forth. What would have happened? They would have all come forth. But Jesus didn't say, Peter, come. He said, come. He calls us all. As the old hymn puts it, Jesus calls us o'er the tumult of our life's wild, restless sea. Day by day, his sweet voice soundeth, saying, Christian, follow me. We're all called by Christ to walk upon the sea. Oh, I don't expect any of you to take a hike to Bermuda this afternoon. But life 
school takes place in a strange schoolhouse. It is the schoolhouse of the sea. Why? Because there are times when it is very peaceful and tranquil. There are times when it may be boisterous and the winds are contrary, and it may be whipped by fierce winds into a cauldron of threatening waves. It may be fraught with potential disasters, financial, business, personal, marriage, children, whatever, health, all kinds of possibilities. And he would remind us in this school that it can go very, very quickly from a tranquil, peaceful lake into a tumultuous, terrifying storm. And life is that way, how quickly things can change. And we're reminded that we're walking on a very tenuous surface and the bottom can give out and we can find ourselves sinking beneath the waves. But Peter, bold Peter, and I think he should be commended for he was the only one that had the faith of saying that he wanted to walk to Christ. And so he swung his legs over the gunwale of the ship, placed his feet upon the water and found it firm beneath his sandals. And he pushed himself upright, no doubt let go with one hand, then with the other, and he was, he was standing on the water. And he started cautiously, no doubt, to walk toward Jesus with a big smile on his face as Jesus was smiling back. He was walking on the water. And then perhaps some wave splashed into his face. He heard the howling of the wind again and he looked away from Jesus down at the waves about his feet and immediately he began to sink. But he had the good sense to cry out, Lord, save me! Jesus reached out his strong hand, picked him up, and brought him back to the ship and immediately the waves ceased. I want you to notice something. The serenity that Christ gave to Peter did not mean that very peacefully he would slip under the waves. It meant that he would walk upon them victoriously. Peter, said Jesus, wherefore didst thou doubt? And God would have us to know that we can walk victoriously over all of life's tempestuous sea if we will look to Christ, look to Christ in faith, trust him, focus our minds and hearts upon him. We can deal with the waves of trial, with the waves of temptation. What do you do with temptation? Do you know how to overcome temptation? It's very simple. I didn't say it's easy. I said it's simple. Look unto Jesus. Do you realize that whenever you get into temptation, you're looking away from Jesus? That's what stirs up the passions, leads us into temptation. Look unto Jesus. When everything looks dark and gloomy and desperate, look unto Jesus. Trust me, he says, and you will find the answer to your problems. I should point out to you this. Jesus isn't the only one that calls us or life's tempestuous sea. The devil also calls us. Come. Come to me. 
But when we find that we try to follow him, it isn't long before we begin to sink beneath the waves. And we cry out to be saved. There is no one there but Satan. And he laughs. Daniel Marsh, a minister a little hundred years ago, tells about one night in a bitter cold winter night in New England. He was sound asleep in the middle of his night when he heard a persistent banging at his door. He got up, put on his robe, and went down, and there was a young man there who told of a young fellow about 20 years of age who had been formerly a part of the pastor's flock. He had been raised in the sanctuary, the Sabbath, the scriptures, but alas, in his mid-teens, he had been lured away by other young people with less noble ambitions and desires, and he had been led little by little by little away from the things of God and into the sins of this world until he had become utterly debauched. The pastor hadn't seen him in years, but he went up and dressed, came down, and with his carriage, horse and carriage, he made his way through 10 miles of snow-covered streets and drifts, and finally to the young man who was in the last hours of his life. And he tried to talk to this man about Christ and his mercy and his forgiveness. But the young man was so wild in his countenance and eyes that he couldn't even see Christ anywhere. And he finally said to him, young man, he said, cry out to the Lord to save you. Just say, Lord, save me. And he said he even uttered the prayer for him. But the young man gave out with a deep, horrible groan. And he said, too late, too late. And the black waters of death swirled up to his neck and then over his mouth. And there was a start, a wide-eyed start of terror. And then he sank beneath the surface and was gone. And as the pastor made his way back through the bleak landscape and the leafless trees bending in the wind, he seemed to hear all of the trees in the wind saying, echoing and re-echoing, too late, too late. He had followed the call of the devil and there was no one there to lift him up. And he said he was invited on another time in the day to come to the home of a man who was a member of his flock, a man who had been emancipated by Christ, whose spirit had been set free. And he made his way down by the river past the waterfall into uh, something of an industrial area of town to the small cottage where the man lived. He had had apparently a stroke, and now had cancer. He'd lost the ability to speak. But he could see from the bright glance of his eye and from the pressure of his hand that Christ was still his anchor and his hope. He couldn't speak and yet he had been writing with chalk on a slate and he asked for the slate and he wrote something but his nerves in his arm were almost gone and try as he could, the pastor couldn't make it out. And he studied it and studied it, he couldn't understand a word on it and and the word in the middle was written larger and he pointed to that and still the pastor couldn't even make that out even though that seemed to be explaining the whole thing and finally in desperation the man took the chalk back again and, and printed the word V-I-C-T-O-R-Y. Thanks be unto God, he could suddenly make out the rest. Thanks be unto God who giveth us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
There it is. He was looking at Christ. And even in the midst of a painful death, he had the victory. He graduated from this school magna cum laude, which means with much praise. And soli Deo Gloria, solely to the glory of God. That's the meaning of life. It is the school of Christ and the great and the single lesson to be learned in every course, in every subject, in every week, in every day, in every experience is trust me and you too can graduate with honors. May we pray. Father, I pray that if there be any here today who have never trusted in Christ, that they may reach out their hand and cry out from their hearts, Lord, save me. I cannot make it across the sea of this world, this life. I will most certainly sink beneath the waves if thou dost not save me. To that end thou didst die and rise again I trust thee now, come into my life and make me thine own and help me from this day forward to, to learn the great, the first, the central lesson of this life that in all things I will trust thee. In thy name, amen. This has been a production of Truth in Action Ministries.